when I when I heard that in the film, I think you guys referenced twenty to thirty years. Yeah, I've probably told a million people that since I've I've heard that in the film. Wow! Like by the time a million is an exaggeration, but I mean everyone I've come across so far since finishing that film the last couple of days, I brought up how we're doing this podcast today, and it's all around dementia and Alzheimer's and the fact that once you show symptoms you could have been developing this disease 20 to 30 years prior to. And, and that stat for me is what really kind of grabbed me and woke me up. Mm. And I felt this obligation to tell everyone around me. It's like, hey, like we need to, this is all prevention. Absolutely. Like we have to get out ahead of it. 100%. I mean, millennials now are approaching, if not already in midlife, right? Like I'm a millennial, I'm four, I just turned 42 years old. Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common form of dementia, it's not the only form, but this is a disease of midlife. Like this is a disease of now with symptoms that appear in late life. So by the time you're diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or likely any form of dementia for that matter, you're already essentially in the late stage of that disease, whether it's, you know, you were diagnosed yesterday. I mean, this is a disease that was simmering under the surface for decades. Is there it's, any other disease similar to it does that? All of all non-communicable chronic diseases. I mean, these conditions don't begin overnight. You know, if you have a heart attack, the the occlusion of your arter arteries didn't begin, you know, the night prior to right. you ending up in the emergency room, right? Parkinson's disease is another condition where by the time you're diagnosed, 50% of the dopamine producing neurons in the substantia nigra, which is the region of the brain associated with Parkinson's disease, are already dead. So, I mean, yes, that's scary and sad for pa for patients, you know, but it's also, I think, incredibly empowering from the standpoint of prevention, because that, that means that we have a window of opportunity to intervene, right, to change the course of our, of our destiny. And that's what I think was my goal, actually, for creating the documentary, was to, um, was to really present novel ideas that had the potential to move the needle on, on these conditions in a really profound way. And, you know, I started it 10 years ago. 10 years ago, nobody was talking about dementia as a preventable condition, right? Now, many people are. But this documentary was really, I mean, you know, I, I hate to, I'm not the type to, to, to pat myself on the back, but, you know, this is, this is an idea that 10 years ago, you couldn't even say without being called a quack or a charlatan, dementia as a pre preventable condition. Um, but now we know, you know, whether it's through modulating our diet or reducing our exposure to air pollution, for example, that this is a potentially preventable condition for, you know, for most, if not all, people who suffer it. And the key word is, is potentially. We don't have all the answers. And you can still do you know, everything quote unquote right and still develop the condition. There is a degree of luck. There is a degree of, of genetic involvement. But, um, but I think the point that I'm trying to drive home with my work is that we don't need to sit idly. We can take action in our lives. See, that's where my mindset has shifted since your film is I always assumed and thought dementia was just a predisposition genetic. I've heard people say like, oh, dementia runs in my family. Mm. So I'm assuming that at some point in my life, I'm going to also have dementia. Do you have it in your family tree? I don't personally. Hmm. Um, well, what's I, interesting is neither did I. Like I, I, my my mom's mom did not have dementia at the time of her passing. My mom's my maternal grandmother passed in '96, and she was cognitively healthy. And my mom's dad did not have dementia. So I mean, it's something that the heritability is low, right? We're all anybody with a brain is vulnerable. The heritability for Parkinson's disease is very low, two, two to three percent in both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. I mean, we have genetic risk factors, but these are not deterministic genes that we're talking about. Do you think those genes are pretty strong, though? Like, if it does run in your family, you are highly likely, or is that we can modify that likeliness with things like diet? I think we can modify the likelihood for sure, because you know they're. Like, I have a genetic risk factor. My mom had the genetic risk factor. Um, I inherited it likely from my mom, possibly from my dad, but these are just risk genes. And there is data suggesting that in other parts of the world, 
where the prevalence, for example, of these pheno of these um, genotypes are just as high as they are here in the United States, disease prevalence is relatively low. Um, and the same genes that in the United States, for example, might put a person at, you know, double or, or even higher of a risk as compared to a non-carrier. In other parts of the world, that gene seems to have little to no association with the condition. So basically what that suggests is if you're genetically at risk for Alzheimer's disease, for example, in the United States, you might simply move to a less industrialized part of the world and see that risk abolished. Ah, interesting. Yeah, so they've, they've shown in southern Italy, I believe, in Ibadan, Nigeria. There are APOE4 carrier, APOE4 is the most prevalent and well-defined Alzheimer's risk gene. That gene exists throughout the world. But in other parts of the world, you know, parts of the world that haven't been exposed yet to the standard American diet, that gene doesn't seem to have the same degree of influence on, on health outcomes. What concentrations of the world have the, the most uh, individuals or, or population with dementia, mm. Alzheimer's, as opposed to like, where is the, the least concentration of people? Well, generally, any part of the world where the diet has become westernized, we see higher prevalence. But also it's important to, to acknowledge that diet isn't the only variable. So um, we're now, there's, there's growing research showing that um, air pollution is related to Alzheimer's disease etiology. Um, They've shown in Mexico City, for example, they've looked at the brains of cadavers across the age spectrum. You know, young, young people, adolescents and children who've been exposed to high levels of air pollution, that they have very similar pathology in their brains um, as you might see in somebody with early Alzheimer's disease. Um, amylo aggregation of amyloid plaque, for example. Um, so nutrition isn't the only variable, which makes a lot of this kind of research difficult to do. Um, you know, social isolation, we know, is another modifiable risk factor. But generally, you know, westernized parts of the world are where you see the highest prevalence. For example, there's research um, showing that Japanese nationals, for example, when they move to the United States, their risk dramatically increases. So it's, you know, taking somebody and then exposing them to the standard American diet and lifestyle seems to increase risk dramatically. So it, it seems to have something to do with the standard American diet and lifestyle. And I, and I think it, it's clear that, you know, we live in amid a, uh, an obesogenic food environment. We, you know, we've inherited a food environment that seems to promote insulin resistance via myriad mechanisms. I think diet plays a huge role, but it's also exposure to environmental toxins like bisphenols and, you know, any number of forever chemicals that have been, that have been shown to influence in insulin signaling in the body. So it's multifactorial, but, um, but yeah, diet, I mean, diet plays a huge role. So, and there's a, this is a dietary pattern that we've now exported around the world. So I think, you know, we're, there are, there's research suggesting that numbers are expected to explode in the coming years. I think 55 million people as of today worldwide suffer from dementia. Um, and we're expected to see those numbers triple in the coming decades. Are we seeing people showing signs of dementia earlier than before, or is it just overall we're seeing more numbers of people? Yeah, so that's um, something that was really fascinating that was that we discuss in the film. Actually, um, one of the interviewees in my documentary is a Brown University researcher named Suzanne Delamonte. Who she was actually, great. She was great, right? She was great. So I think a lot of people today have kind of heard ambiently this concept of type three diabetes. You know, that Alzheimer's disease may, in a way, be a form of diabetes of the brain. That was the first time I've heard that, actually. That was the first time? That was the first time. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I like hearing that, that that was the first time, because that, that shows that this idea still is relatively um, shrouded, you know? And, uh, and so that's, that's cool to hear. This, this researcher coined the term type 3 diabetes. She's a neuropathologist at Brown, and she also has a master's in public health. And so what she talks about in our film is that we're seeing rates increase across the age spectrum. So these aren't just in the oldest old that we're seeing numbers increase. We're seeing it increase, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. So it's there's definitely an environmental trigger. Um, 
and it and it and it makes sense because when you look at again these you know these modifiable risk factors so when it comes to alzheimer's disease you've got let me just explain what that means so you know you have what are called your non-modifiable risk factors and your modifiable risk factors modifiable suggests that we have influence we have agency right our non-modifiable risk factors are generally age gender and genetics you can't change your genes although you can influence how your genes express themselves it's known as epigenetics we have gender you can't change your gender women are at double the risk as compared to men and then you have age so age is still the number one risk factor but as Dr. Delamonte discusses in the film, we're seeing, we're seeing incidents increase across the age spectrum. Obviously, it's very rare in very young people, um, but 50s, 60s, and beyond, um, we, are, we are apparently seeing, seeing rates increase. And then among the modifiable risk factors, you have about a dozen or so, um, but obesity, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes are, we'll just take those, right? We're seeing rates of obesity, which is a risk factor, increase. We're seeing rates of type 2 diabetes increase. We're seeing hypertension increase. 50% of adults today, as I, as I mentioned, are essentially obese. Also, 50% of adults today have hypertension, which is high blood pressure. We're seeing insulin resistance increase. You know, Today, now, I think, what is it? 50% of adults have either type two diabetes or pre-diabetes, which is essentially early stage type That's two diabetes. That's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And so, and th- that those are all increasing in their prevalence. So how it would be, you know, it, it doesn't take a stretch of logic to imagine how rates of these related conditions like Alzheimer's disease are also increasing in their prevalence. 